anxiety, depression, all those things are only caused by demons. Anxiety, worry, fear, doubt, shame. This is the cost of discipleship in following Jesus. I'm gonna wake up at 5 a.m. every day of the week and I'm gonna read my Bible for five hours. It's like, well, what time do you start work? Seven. It's like, all right, dude, that's not gonna happen. If you told me that 10 years ago, I'd be like, nope, I'm out. Yeah. I'm not doing this pure desire thing. <laughs> Hey there, Pure Desire family. We have started a new YouTube channel called Pure Desire Clips. This channel will be sharing short bite-sized excerpts from the main podcast episode in a much more approachable and consumable way. This channel is for those of you who are super busy and might not have time to listen to the full length episode every week. I'll only slightly judge you for this just a little bit. The link to our clips channel will be in the description down below as well as on our about page on this YouTube channel. Make sure to check out the channel and hit that subscribe button if you find that form of content valuable. Also click the notification bell so you never miss a new clip. Thanks so much for being part of the Pure Desire community and without further ado, let's get into the episode. Benny B, welcome back to the show, my man. Glad to have you in person. I don't know if listeners know this, you're from Texas. That's right. And you're usually on Zoom, but now you're in studio. So welcome, man. I am. What a treat. It's been, uh, it's been, it's giving. I've been looking forward <laughs> to much coffee. I've been looking forward to this for a while, for a long time. So great to see you guys face to face. Yes. Yeah. This is the first pod in person, I think. Not yeah. on Zoom. Yeah, that's right. With me. Yeah. So it's perfect. So as uh, people will see next week, we have you for two episodes. Uh, so this is the first one. And uh, as a good friend of ours um, and the show, we know that one of the topics you love to talk about is mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, dude, it's from like swag um, that you saw on your website to content you're posting online. We know this is an area of passion for you uh, and definitely a part of your story, specifically how sexual addiction and pornography impact our mental health. Uh, so we're going to dive into this topic, and we just knew you were the right guy. Uh, and in all fairness, you gave us this topic. So we knew you were the right guy times <laughs> right. too. Um, but as we start, the term mental health gets thrown around a lot, um, and it's not in like a negative way necessarily, but it is something that a lot of people hear. So can you help us by giving us a clear definition of what mental health actually means? Yeah, I think of mental health as the state of one's psychological and emotional well-being the state of somebody's psychological and emotional well-being. I think a lot of times when people think of mental health, they think of the what can, I don't want to say negative aspects of it, but the uncomfortable aspects of it. Like if you're feeling anxious, if you're depressed, oh, that's mental health. I don't struggle with mental health. I don't deal with mental health. No, we yeah. all deal with mental health, just like we all deal with physical health because yeah. there's the state of the well-being of our physical bodies. Yeah. And so that's how I sum it up. And uh, all of us at one point in our life, if you've ever been stressed, you've struggled with your mental health. Mm. If you've ever been sad, you've ever gone through grief, you've ever been fearful, you've struggled with your mental health. So it affects every, every single one of us. Yeah. 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 I think you're right in the question, Trevor, that mental health can be kind of a, uh, if I could say a turnoff towards for Christians or churches, because yeah. it is so popular yeah. in the social sphere or in, right. you know, government programs and improving mental health. And I don't know why sometimes we're, we feel like we have to be against something if it's really big in culture, because it's, it's not like a cultural thing outside of faith. It's just a human condition. But I think to connect it to some biblical faith, I think the word shalom Mm. really encompasses mental health because mm. shalom in the Hebrew or in the way the Jews used it encompassed like all of life. It was to be in a good place of peace with God, my fellow man, yeah. the land I'm living in, just in this place of wellness. And wellness, I think, would certainly include um, what's happening mentally. And so biblical concepts uh, like anxiety, worry, fear, doubt, shame, yep. um, abandonment, rejection, like all of those play into our mental health. And the yes. Bible has a ton to say about all of those topics and how we find mm -hmm. ourselves in Christ, um, in, in our maturing and growth in Christ, yeah. working through some of those issues. And so mm -hmm. I just want to make sure for some listeners that do have that maybe mm -hmm. aversion to mental health of like, oh, that's a... You know, in, in Ted's, Ted's Robert's words, you know, psychobabble, it's like, no, mental health is a very biblical concept because yeah. it involves all of those 
um, issues that we face, and that's a part of our growth and development in Christ. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I like what you guys are saying because it's broadening the definition for people. Where because when I hear mental health, I think of someone who's depressed or needs to be in a psych ward or is in a straitjacket or something like that. When that's more of what you see maybe in the movies, but mental health encompasses so much more. And so it excites me that that's where we're starting because I think that maybe more people feel included in this conversation now moving yeah. forward. Amen. Yeah. So. Ben, I know that you've been a part of Josh McDowell Ministries and, and the, the movement that you're a part of uh, kind of sprang out of that mm-hmm. uh, for young adults. And I know uh, JMM has been a big part of research, that you've been a part of some research and, and have now had tons of experience of working with young adults and, and people in this sphere of mental health. So what have you found, maybe in particular in this season in our world, like what are the, the particular challenges that people are facing and what are the struggles around mental health right now? Yeah, I think of a couple stats. Um, one was from 2019, and that's when uh, teenagers polled said that seven. Well, it was 70 percent of teens say anxiety and depression are major issues among their peers. And then for um, young adults, teens, second leading cause of death was suicide. I think of a stat in 2021 that 41% of Americans were were reporting symptoms of anxiety and depression. That number has gone, the people who did that survey, uh, that number has gone down, thankfully, Mm -hmm. post-COVID. But loneliness also is an epidemic. So I would put anxiety, depression, and loneliness. As far as the mental, I like to call it mental ill health um, rather than mental illness. Um, That's a whole nother topic, but I think things are way too diagnosed and Mm. um, a disease-based model has been copied and pasted onto mental health in this country and mental health or mental ill health is not a death sentence. I'm living proof. So many friends are living proof. You can find hope from suicide, anxiety, depression. You can overcome these things because of neuroplasticity Mm -hmm. and how God has created our brains to change, just like pornography addiction, right? Some people used to say that addiction is a disease. Um, we know that you can overcome it. You can mm-hmm. heal. Your brain can change. And yeah. so I've seen a lot of that in the research with people I've worked with in my own life. Yeah. Um, yeah. But anxiety, depression, and, and loneliness are the biggest ones. Yeah. Um, it is interesting, too, because they talk about it, and a lot of you know uh, researchers, a lot of experts today will talk about how we're living in the most connected time the world mm-hmm. has ever had, but also the most lonely time that we've ever had. And I think that that's what's unique and not just for young people. I think this is for anybody who lives in the online world. Um, you know, unless you're a hermit that lives somewhere that doesn't have the internet, uh, which sounds nice from time to time. But yep. um, I think that that's a unique aspect because you can feel this sense of I am connected. I do have community. People do know me. I know people. And I think that that um, is a false community or false belonging. And so I think that that is something that lends itself to issues or struggles with mental ill health or whatever you want to call it, Ben. But I just think that that's something that we need to pay attention to when having conversations about mental health, because there is this like faux belonging or faux connection that we can experience, believing that that's actually what's happening when it's not. Yeah. Our uh, small group was actually talking about loneliness a little last night and how it feels like even churches are contributing to this because we're streaming everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so you can live in Indiana and go to church, quote unquote, go right. to church by watching your favorite pastor in California every yeah. weekend, yeah. not leave your house, not engage in a small group, because any discipleship tool is probably online. You could probably go through a class or watch some excellent teacher do a whole right. course on anything you want to learn about. So now we're not going to a Sunday school class or, or a small group to learn and grow and be challenged. It's It's kind of this, um, maybe the fallacy that what I need is information. You know, if I go to church and I hear the sermon, I get information. But information doesn't lead us to transformation, and we stay very disconnected from the people around us. Uh, I I remember, too, kind of along these lines of loneliness, because I think that's a huge contributing factor that loneliness in and of itself, I don't know, is a mental health problem, but I think it contributes and creates Mm -hmm. so many mental health problems. And, And if we're isolated and withdrawn from real community, Mm -hmm. we're suffering. And what I was going to say is I remember, you know, in that season, the first year or two after COVID, that my family and I were choosing to find a way to go to church, make it work, you know, in spite of all the regulations we were all facing. And I, I counted up 
um, between arriving in the parking lot and getting back in our minivan, how many interactions I'd had mm. with people. And there were at least 10 people just, and I hadn't, I, I didn't even go out of my way to seek someone yeah. out, but walking into the building, found a couple we knew and were just saying hi, yeah. checking our kids in, you know, knew the, the pastor there, yeah. talked to him a little bit, just yep. the people you sat next to. And so without, all we did was quote unquote, go to church, just like we would have online. But because we were there in person, we had 10 human interactions mm-hmm. with other people. And it was yeah. like, man, I, I think we just missed how easily in today's virtual world mm. we settle for non-personal interaction, yeah. but think that we're still having relationships. Yeah. yeah. And when it comes to loneliness, one of the biggest things we miss, I've been saying this for years, loneliness is not a lack of friends. It's a lack of meaningful connection. Mm. Mm because that's why we can say, hey, here and there, be connected to people on social media, quick DM, quick comment, but you can have all these surface level interactions and still feel lonely. That's why Gen Z are so lonely because they're not, many aren't being taught how to have Mm -hmm. deep conversations, meaningful connection, talking about your fears, your hopes, your dreams, stuff like the faster scale, how you're (laughs) really doing, you know, check-ins. And it's that, that meaningful connection um, with God and with others that cures loneliness. Yeah. And that's what's mm-hmm. so interesting about social media is, you know, we have uh, a mutual friend who lives uh, on the East Coast, and I can see online what he's doing and feel like I somehow am involved in his life, mm-hmm. but I'm not. Like, And so that, again, is that faux kind of connection where normally I would just have to call him or text him or FaceTime him to get that kind of information, and then there's relationship built in. And again, it's like, and to your point, Nick, it's not information equals connection either. Mm-hmm. It's actual connection that has to take place. Okay, so let's um, move a little bit into the church specifically. I think for many in the church, the issue or topic of mental health can be viewed as um, an unbiblical or non-biblical issue and minimized in that way. How have you approached the topic, specifically mental health, that when in a way that you're using Scripture, God's design, to speak on the importance of our mental health? Um, I go to the Bible. And, um, novel idea. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Novel idea. I learned this from Henry cloud several years ago, got to spend some time with him and he was talking about in the (laughs) eighties, wanting to talk about healing concepts and whatnot. And people were like, I don't want to talk psychology with you. He's like, I don't want to talk psychology with you either. I want to talk Bible with you. (laughs) And, uh, he really helped me see how many of these concepts are in the Bible. And so I go to so many of the narratives like, David was anxious. He was running from King Saul, um, and Saul was trying to take his life, and he was hiding in caves. I'm like, that is a traumatized man who's so anxious and hiding. Um, We also see so many examples of David being depressed and going through grief in the Psalms. Mm -hmm. Um, We see Job. Man, it's so profound when he loses his health, his wealth, and his family. He says, why did, my, why did I not perish when my mother gave birth to me? I've never said those lines, but I've been so depressed and suicidal and having suicidal thoughts at times. And so we see that example yeah. in Scripture. We see uh, Jonah. He was so <coughs> angry and running from God and, and maybe even filled with rage. We see that Elijah was suicidal, and we see Jesus in the garden um, sweating, not, what does it say? Not, not actual blood, but it was like drops like blood. I think it says, Mm -hmm. uh, in the original language, but he was so filled with, um, stress, stress. Yeah. We see all these examples of biblical figures and people we would say that we look up to, um, or that are, were heroes of the faith, Mm -hmm. so to speak, especially Jesus, you know? Um, but these people dealt with mental health stuff, too. And so if it happened to them, why would it not happen to us? And if it was okay, not not okay, but if more than okay, if God went to the extent to write this down in scripture mm-hmm. so that we would see it today and know that it's okay to struggle and that other people are struggling and struggling with your mental health doesn't mean you're less spiritual or less holy or less healthy or less godly. Uh, it's part of living in a fallen world. Um, God wants us to know that. And he went to the extent of writing that down in scripture for us. Yeah. 
Well, you think about when Jesus was asked about the greatest commandment, he quoted Deuteronomy and said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And both heart and mind kind of are two dynamics of what we would call throughout Scripture the inner man or the inner person. Yep. And, and so I think biblical authors all had this awareness that we weren't just a body mm. and we weren't also only a soul, like this eternal part that could, could, could commune with God and live forever, that there was our inner thoughts and our will and our emotions and our desires and yep. the things that we want and feel and experience. Like the Bible deals with that a ton. I mean, the Apostle Paul yep. had so much to say about his struggles and wrestling with why do I do what I don't want to do yep. and, and, and where yep. do desires come from and how are they transformed and... You know, I, I think it's Galatians chapter 5 where he talks about the old self and the new man are in this constant tension between each other. And, and what he's really, I think, describing there is there's kind of this inner person that is still being transformed yeah. but yeah. has desires and wants and needs that are maybe contrary to what the Holy Spirit is birthing mm -hmm. in us. So the Bible might use different language, and, and I think it's appropriate if we need to, you know, maybe we're reading a book or hearing a, a secular podcast on mental health, if we just translated a couple of the words and used like heart <laughs> or yeah. inner person in right. place of what we're hearing, we'd be like, oh, they're actually talking about how God designed us mm -hmm. yeah. and what sin and fallenness have done to us and how Christ is redeeming us. And maybe they're not doing it through the lens of faith, but it's, mm -hmm. it's all over scripture when we start to think of it through some of those terms. I go back to like Genesis um, and even like Psalm 139, where you talk about original design of how God created our bodies to have a brain that has a left side and a right side, that one is more experiential, one is more information. And then also he gave us emotions. Like it's, it is literally part of the DNA of being a human being to have those. And so I, the, for me, that's where I tend to go because I think that um, I won't necessarily, it could be kind of a hot take, but I, I'm not going to necessarily say everyone feels this way, but the pushback I tend to get, it seems like it's coming from a place of not wanting to acknowledge those negative emotions or what is perceived as negative emotion, not wanting to go back into the difficulties of life. So it's like, I'll just bypass those and move on mm -hmm. when in reality, they're actually, they're counteracting something that God's built into them, um, being able to feel your emotions, being able to process the pain and difficulty that we have. And so I just tend to go back to, original design, how God created us, because if he just wanted a soul, he wouldn't have created a body. So in connection to what we do at Pure Desire, and Ben, I know part of your story as well is helping people overcome pornography and other mm -hmm. issues with sexual brokenness. And when we talk about you know pornography and those types of issues, we tend to think of it more as a behavior or an action. Mm -hmm. Uh, but pornography also has a very negative impact on our mental health. Uh, so what ways have you seen pornography have that negative impact on mental health? There's three main ones that I've seen. First is we know, or if you've been listening or following Pure Desire for a while, you know the impact of pornography on the brain. Just thinking about the pre, you know, prefrontal, your frontal lobes, um, frontal lobe atrophy, watching porn, um, mm -hmm. less oxygen flows to your brain. Yeah. Uh, my mentor, Josh McDowell, says if you, if you watch porn, you give up your brain. <laughs> Uh, it just makes you a lot more reactive and procrastination and trouble thinking clearly. And we're seeing even secularly people quitting porn. Like I saw Steve-O said he did a whole year of no masturbate. You know Steve-O from Jackass, the show yeah. Jackass? Yeah. yeah. Um, he did a whole year. And this guy is not a Christian by any means. Yeah. Did a whole year of not looking at porn, not masturbating. And he said it was the most productive year of his life. Wow. Um, and so we're seeing people in secular culture talk about the benefits personally, mm -hmm. not to mention the benefits on the world and porn contributes or is sex trafficking and all the harm done to relationships and whatnot. Um, but firstly, the brain, you're going to have the best functioning brain if you quit porn. Um, and that's going to help you be more focused. That's going to help you be more um, vigilant with your thoughts. I know for me, particularly when it comes to anxiety, um, I feel like when I face a situation where I know that I'm going to become anxious, if there's certain things I am doing, like that are causing my brain to be in peak performance, like um, sleeping eight or nine hours a night, as opposed to sleeping six, I know that I'm going to do a lot better mm -hmm. in that situation and have lower anxiety or the way I'm eating or less caffeine, all kinds of things. And uh, a huge one of those things is 
getting rid of porn. Yep. You're going to be able, your mental health is going to be so much better. Secondly, is there's many studies showing a correlation between the amount of porn somebody comes, consumes and the amount of anxiety, depression, and loneliness mm. that they're dealing yeah. with. Lots yeah. of studies, you can Google, Google them. But one that I think of was, this was done a couple of years ago at Steubenville University. Um, they looked at college students who were lifelong porn consumer, consumers. And of those lifelong porn consumers... 20% of them had severe anxiety. And this was higher than the rest of hmm. the, the population yeah. on campus. Uh, and then the third thing I would say is thinking about my story, thinking about when I l- led groups for years. Um, porn was such a contributing factor to depression and shame. And it's like shame and depression would set me up to go to porn but then porn would make me create more of it, create more <laughs> yep. shame and depression in yep. my life. And it was just this endless cycle. And I see that in so many people's lives because yeah. something a lot of people don't understand about depression. And I didn't understand for years is that so often depression is caused by feeling hopeless about dealing with or overcoming a situation. A lot of times we think that depression is random and I just got no idea what's going on. But if you start getting into, you know, faster scale type of stuff, and we know that on the faster scale, anxiety is not random. Depression is not random. The faster scale really helped me um, my early years in recovery, figuring out why I was getting so anxious, why I was getting so depressed. If you master the faster, it's really going to help your mental health. Um, and so master depression, the fast, master, master, master the faster. Right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Uh, Thank you, Mike. If you didn't have yeah. credit, Michael die. Yes. yes, exactly. In the Genesis process. That's yes. right. <laughs> and, uh, so depression, it's, it's feeling right. You get ticked off, you get exhausted, and then you're feeling hopeless about a situation and your ability to overcome it. And that's what I've seen in so many people's lives. So the way I would get address the double bind and get out of depression was saying, um, basically, what limbic lie am I believing from trauma in my life? Okay, I'm believing that I'm hopeless because, you know, I went on a, I went on a date, I felt rejected, or mm-hmm. um, or I gave this talk and I messed up, and now I'm, I was criticizing myself and yeah. speeding up and ticked yeah. off and believing this lie that I'm never going to be as good as that speaker, I'm never going to get married, whatever, and completely sinking into that, believing it, and then the emotional... Um, the emotional response of that thought, that belief is depression and feeling this complete amount of hopelessness and, and grief. Yeah. And so working through that double bind, addressing it, um, it's been about 10 years of doing that. And now there'll be like one or two times a year where I'll get depressed maybe for a day or two, as opposed to 10 years ago, I was living in mm, depression, living there. in yeah. Exhaust, yeah. exhaustion. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think is a really important aspect to this too is we've already talked about, you know, shame, but shame really creating more and more isolation, pulling away from relationships. And I mean, that obviously contributing to depression, suicidal ideation, you know, things like that, other destructive behaviors. Um, but I really do feel like that is something that in this, in this conversation needs to be hit again and again is the importance of relationships, the important uh, the importance of connection and belonging to a group of people. And this is where I think Christians, maybe even more than anybody, anybody else, um, have that opportunity inside of the church that you're able to have a connection with people who are on the same mission, are of the same mind, and are moving in the same direction toward Jesus. Um, but yeah, isolation is so damaging. And specifically with pornography, it's something I know for me, I would isolate because I felt shame for the behavior, yes, but I also felt double shame because I couldn't stop the behavior even though I knew it was wrong, which why would I want to tell anybody that, you know, which created more isolation. And so I, I feel like that is like the snowball that gets going and then it just builds and becomes bigger and bigger as you keep going. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, when I look back at the seasons of my life where I've been stuck in use of pornography and, and, and all of that, the way I would describe it is like having a divided brain. Because there's a part of your brain that was kind of always on that. And, and no matter what phase I was in, 
you know, the way Patrick Carnes describes the four phases, like first is um, the preoccupation. Well, if I'm, I'm preoccupied, I'm starting to think about it, but I'm also mm. in my faith and in my integrity trying to fight it. So mm. there's a part of my brain like always trying to push away, don't think about that, you're not going to go there again, you, you promised God and your wife you wouldn't do that anymore. And so, you know, this part of your brain is always like simultaneously fighting against the idea of lust and porn, but also somehow entertaining it. And if you take a step further, you know, the next step is ritualization and you're starting to go back into some of your old behaviors. Well, what happened what happened there in my brain is like, well, I don't really want to think about what I'm doing. Now I'm rationalizing, I'm yep. denying it, I'm minimizing it, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to maintain like normal life over here. But this other part of my brain is starting to get into my rituals of whether it's surfing social media or, you mm -hmm. know, tr starting to hide little indiscretions. Well, I'm divided. And then obviously when you're acting out, and then there's the shame and the guilt and the remorse and like, mm -hmm. how can I do this again? Well, now there's a part of your brain managing that while you're trying to do normal life over here. And then you get kind of into the purge side of, okay, now I'm, I'm doing it right with God and others and I'm going to get everything you know, back on track. Well, it's all because of this other part of your brain that has this undealt with issues with pornography. Yeah. And so just everywhere you go, you feel like you've got this divided brain mm -hmm. versus you know, our faith calls us to integrity and integrity is ultimately means wholeness. Mm -hmm. Integrity doesn't mean you know being pure and not looking at porn. It means being the same. Mm -hmm. And that what my brain is on at the moment is like, that's all that I need to be on because there's nothing else mm -hmm. taking up all this mental space. Um, and you do, yeah. I mean, a very kind of uh, fleshly or you know human side, you can be more productive. You can be more focused. Mm -hmm. But also there's just more peace. There's more joy yeah. of like, right. I'm not fighting this other side of me that I don't totally understand. And so I think the impact that had on my mental health was really hard for me to explain because I was so busy yeah. trying not to look at it or think mm -hmm. about it. Right. But if you'd have asked, you know, do you feel whole or like there's integrity? It's like, no, I, I just always feel divided. And mm -hmm. so um, maybe there's others out there that could really relate to that kind of feeling of that divided brain. Yeah, totally. Okay, so let's look at the other side. Our organization and yours too, Resolution Movement, uh, are focused on helping people, men and women, break free from compulsive behaviors. And specifically, ours is sexual addiction. I know for you, you also have aspects of that that you'd speak to. Um, and really, it's impact on our lives. So let's look at how the recovery journey from a sexual addiction or any kind of compulsive sexual struggle, how that impacts our health in a positive way. What does that look like? So could you ask that again? Yes, I know, I know. So how does the recovery journey from a sexual addiction or struggle impact our mental health in a positive way? Oh, in so many ways. Um, I think, first I think about relationships. Uh, as we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. loneliness is not a lack of friends, it's a lack of meaningful connection. And when you get into pure desire or good recovery, I think specifically about a life of no secrets. When you develop a life of no secrets where one or two or your whole group knows everything about you and you're constantly talking to them throughout the week and talking about how you're really doing, you feel known and understood and accepted. Um, and that ends loneliness. Uh, and that would be one thing uh, because loneliness contributes to so many other things like anxiety and, and depression. Another thing would be, if I think about my own journey, um, the symptoms, so symptoms of trauma and things we have dealt with in, the, in life often will come out through stress, anxiety, depression, porn, and anger issue. Um, the root cause is so often the same. Mm -hmm. And so in my life, as I was healing from or overcoming porn, uh, what I was overcoming too was anxiety and depression. As I worked through the faster scale, as I understood that, as I started to put the pieces together. Um, and I continually go back to Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. And so thinking about, in my life, anxiety, the pattern of anxiety I developed was very specific it was a fear of rejection. It was, if I had to, thinking about high school or college, if I had to pre present before the class, mm -hmm. oh, that would put anxiety through the roof. Or even now as a speaker, sometimes that will happen. Um, or around people, or am I going to be rejected? Am I going to be bullied? bullied? Because fr my friends bullied me growing up. My dad was emotionally and physically abusive. Mm. And so that created this pattern of 
my brain is on alert trying mm-hmm. to avoid those things happen yeah. again. Yeah. So anything that looks like it, smells like it, is like it at all, my brain would go into the state of fight or flight yeah. or anxiety. Um, and that's because Proverbs 4.23, I had to look at my heart. What has happened to my heart? It had been wounded. Everything was flowing from that. Or depression, same kind of thing. When I gave up fighting the anxiety, eventually I would agree with it. Mm. Rather than trying to avoid the rejection, I'd eventually give in and agree with the rejection, Mm. that I am worthless, that I am not good enough. Um, And that was kind of a way of, man, if I reject people or if I reject myself first, then others can't reject me. Yes, that's a thing. And uh, it's a way of kind of self-sabotage or, um, you know, self Rejection, self betrayal, all those form of terms. protection. It's a perform- yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. And again, I had to look at my heart. What had what had happened to my heart? Oh, well, receiving this abuse, the rejection, these lies. Eventually, the lies felt so real. I didn't know they were lies. Mm. I was living yeah. out of these lies, believing that I truly was worthless, and that would just set me up again and again to feel depressed. And. Um, and then so, yeah, with pornography as well, pornography was a way to escape and to cope with those lies and those feelings. So so often it's similar root issues um, specific to us because none of them are random. Um, we say that anxiety and depression are signals to, to be answered. Like mm. God designed you to have a fight or flight system in your brain to protect you, mm-hmm. to jump out of the... Road, if you're crossing the road and a yeah. teenage driver comes, you know, maybe one of Nick's kids <laughs> learning to drive comes <laughs> peeling around the corner. <laughs> no, I'm sure they're great drivers. Yeah, you know, I know so which great. one that would be. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> there's, there's one. Your fear system causes you to jump out of the way. That's great, but the problem is that gets hijacked for mm-hmm. relational issues, rejection, other things. Yeah. Um, and God designed your brain that way to keep you safe. Um, but then we have to learn how to heal from that and yeah. and overcome that. And so as we're growing in sexual wholeness, if we're dealing with it in the way pure desire deals with it, or if we're dealing with it holistically, spiritually, yeah. emotionally, yeah. relationally, physically, then what we will see, like I saw, is anxiety going down, depression going down, and some of those mm-hmm. symptoms even going away completely. Yeah. 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 What I hear you describing, Ben, is that we're moving from the what to the why. Mm. And I, I think in our Christian upbringing, if we grew up in, a, in you know, that environment, we were taught a lot about the what. You know, mm. So I know I'm feeling anger, or I, I realize I'm feeling lust, or yes. I realize that I'm feeling um, down and rejected. And, and I think in some of that training, we just took the what to Jesus, and we just confessed, I'm feeling angry, God, take mm. this, I don't want to be an angry person, you know, I, I leave it with him. And then, it would, you know, you'd be right back there the next day, I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling lustful, I'm feeling... And, and so the what didn't get us very far, but in the process of pure desire, like for me, it was all the whys of like, well, why mm. am I angry right now? Yep. Well, because that comment someone made made me feel a little disrespected, mm-hmm. and disrespect can attach to mm-hmm. being valuable or good enough, and the fear of not being good enough is deeply woven into my story and some of my themes from childhood. And so I, I had all these light bulb moment, moments through pure desire of the why being kind of like, Oh, that's why. And even lust, you know, we've talked about it a lot on this show that it's not random. Um, yes, we do have the capacity for lust, but the the fact that we feel it, when we feel it, how we feel it is not yeah. random. It's mm-hmm. associated to our why. Right. And when someone helps us see the why, well, all of those are mental health questions of why mm-hmm. do I feel this? And so when we begin to really gain that self-awareness of understanding what's happening in my patterns of thinking, in my limbic system of the fight, yeah. flight, or freeze, and I can answer some of the why question, then I think I can really more authentically grow with Christ and others because now I'm just not trying to surrender the what, but blind to everything driving yeah. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm actually letting people into that deeper stuff mm-hmm. and being able to express those fears. I mean, I'd, I'd never really been able to voice, I have this pervasive fear that I'm not good enough, that I don't measure up, that I don't have what it takes. And when others hear that and know that about you and affirm you, it's like the level of connection goes way up, the yeah. level of belonging, and yeah. now it's... And, and when you receive that connection, then you're able to receive it because it's not for your surfacey performance that got people to like you. It's like, no, they actually knew me. They knew my fears yeah. and worries and doubts, and they still accepted me. Well, now I feel like I belong because of my weakness. Mm-hmm. I, I belong because of my brokenness. And that's far more affirming in the long run than feeling like I only belong because of my success or my performance. And yeah. so 
I think that's where mental health is impacted for the good is we're answering the why question. Yep. And that takes us so much deeper yep. uh, with God and others. Mm-hmm. I think one of the things for me too is that um, when dealing with pornography, understanding the why, getting behind the behavior, and then starting to create sobriety and sexual wholeness, what I also saw uh, more clearly was other areas of my life that were impacting my mental health. Um, food, mm. fitness, um, was I getting enough sleep? You know, even things like what procrastination can do um, to us. Like you're able to not only understand what's motivating these other behaviors that are impacting you at a holistic level, but then you're also given the tools to address those things. And so like my second time through Seven Pillars, it was far less about pornography and sexually acting out and had much more to do with food and my addiction to food. Um, And then, you know, my life has been reshaped because of that. And so I feel like that's, and we'll kind of get into it a little bit later, but that's one of the things I think that can help maintain mental health for the long haul is when you're able to address an area like this that keeps you in isolation and shame and not only pulls you out of those things, but then gives you the tools to address anything else that you have in your life too, because there is so much that can impact our mental health, not just our sexuality. Yeah. Amen. So we we discussed here the the benefits of um, recovery and mental health, and thankfully, not everyone listening to the podcast is in the midst of their recovery. You know, lots and lots of people mm-hmm. are. They're maybe years down the road. They're in a new space, and so what would you say to the, to them, Ben, or maybe someone listening in who sexual brokenness hasn't been their story? Maybe it's a loved one's, or there's another reason they're listening to this podcast. Um, so we don't we don't have to be in recovery to be working on our mental health. Right. What are other approaches? that you would encourage people to take that could help them address their mental approach outside of the whole sphere of recovery? There's lots. And as I think about it, like the theological framework is, I've thought in my my life a lot, like this is the cost of discipleship in following Jesus. Because following Jesus is, it's not about coasting in life. It's not about gratifying the flesh. It's not about being a poor steward of your time or money or body. It's actually being a good steward mm-hmm. of your and worshiping the Lord with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, being a good steward of your body, of your mind. I think about 1 Thessalonians 4.3, this is God's will, your sanctification, flee sexual immorality, and to your point, integrity, same root word of integrated. Mm -hmm. And so wholeness, we're following Jesus is about wholeness. And um, so it's really discipleship, investing in our sexual health, our mental health, physical health, emotional health. Mm -hmm. And um, so outside of recovery specifically, I think of so many other practices I've started that have been helpful for my mental health. One of them is a 24-hour Sabbath. Started doing that almost Mm. two years ago. Nice. And um, that has just been so good in making it a point to try and not hit stress at any point in those 24 hours. And setting up my life in a way where I don't get stressed, that means leaving sometimes 30 minutes early to go to church or whatever and yeah. driving the speed limit and keeping yeah. the stress down. Um, it, it means trying not to do dishes or laundry or anything like that during the 24 hours. It means uh, pleasure stacking and yeah. topping off the night with time with God and a good cigar and mm-hmm. listening to my favorite podcasts and spending times with time with friends. Mm -hmm. And what I found is what I practice on Sabbaths has started transferring over to the other six days of the Mm -hmm. week. So I find myself driving slow, getting places early, Mm -hmm. you know, which is God's way, by the way. It's God's way for life. Yeah. (laughs) Being off my phone more. And it's like those habits start carrying over Mm -hmm. and then causing my mental health to be better because I'm less stressed, less anxious, not on the faster scale as easily, less chance of me getting all the way down to exhaustion, depression. Uh, That would be one. Another one is I do a 30 minute prayer walk six days a week Mm. and never have thought of myself as a prayer warrior or like big prayer. It doesn't come naturally, but to get in my body Mm. and to calm my nervous system, to go Mm -hmm. for a walk, Um, the body is the temple that has been a huge thing. Um, because on that 30 minute walk, I'm praying through different things like Psalm 103, the benefits and remind myself of the benefits to following God and Mm -hmm. how he forgives all your sin, heals all your diseases, spending time with him. And I'm taking my eyes 
off of the stress, the tasks of the day, and I'm doing that. Yeah. Another thing that's been huge is just having a hobby, mm. a hobby where during that hobby, all you're thinking about is the hobby because it consumes your mind and your body so much. Yeah. And for me, that's lifting weights. And I've gotten real into it, like nerding out like the protein and, you know, <laughs> the movements and all of that. But when I'm doing it. that, it's like I'm, yeah. it's like I'm so focused on that yeah. in my body. It's like hard to think about anything mm-hmm. from daily life. And I think having those breaks, and that's why we yeah. see a lot of top leaders, it's like they're already so busy, but then they make time to become a pilot or to... Yeah start this hobby because it just right. creates an interruption in your brain from always being on and yeah. focusing and thinking. Um, and then what you eat is important too. I quit yeah. caffeine for 10 months. Um, I'm sorry. And yeah. <laughs> and people like I had been to the doctor and talking about my mental health and they're like, you need to get the stress down, get the anxiety down caffeine. That's what they kept saying. I was like, there's no chance. I'm in this specialty yeah. coffee. I'm going to Portland. I'm going to drink all the pour overs. <laughs> I'm going for it. Cream. Don't offend me. I don't want to ruin the coffee. Don't ask <laughs> if I want cream and sugar. Uh, Shots fired. All yeah. right. <laughs> so, but that's how I was. But then it got to this point. Okay. Following Jesus, wholeness, whatever the cost. Yeah. And so I quit caffeine and I kid you not, my nervous system and the stress in my body, I realized I didn't so much have a caffeine and stress or I didn't so much have a stress and anxiety problem. I had a caffeine problem Mm. because I would start each day on like a level two out of 10 intensity of just, it felt like static and stress in my body and my nervous system on alert. And then when I quit caffeine, I was starting at a zero. Mm. I felt like I was actually in restoration on the faster scale, (laughs) not, not, not being, you know, yeah. Not lying about being in restoration on the faster scale. Right. <clears throat> so um, hopefully those things are helpful to some people. Yeah. The only other things I wrote down, I think those are all good. I think really, honestly, any spiritual discipline, um, something that slows you down and enters you into a relationship with the Lord is is really important. I think therapy is an excellent thing. Um, and I can't speak more highly of it. Um, I also think journaling, that's one of those things too, it really slows you down. You can engage your, all your senses, your emotions. And then I just wrote down taking care of your body, like mm-hmm. not just what you eat and drink, but also sleep, moving your body yes. around. Um, gosh, even last night, uh, one of my mentors was talking about how important it is once you eat to just start moving your body almost immediately mm-hmm. and how that actually helps break down the food and keeps you in a healthier space. And it's like, well, great. I'm going to start walking more after lunch. You know, things like that. I think just looking at it from a holistic perspective. Yeah. And I think we're at a day and age, even in the church, where even if it's not a therapist or a counselor, there are a lot of other people operating in that sphere coaches that could help with and, mental yeah. health, yeah. like spiritual directors yes. and coaches. And I think just the value, even if it's a close friend that you really respect them for their wisdom, that value of bouncing things off another person who can see your blind spots better mm-hmm. than you can, yeah. you know, can help you take a look in the mirror because we're used to seeing what we've always seen, but another person can ask a question a slightly different way and and suddenly maybe a, a, an issue that we've been having, and it doesn't have to be a, about recovery, it could just be one of those things you listed, Ben, of where we're stuck in something. Mm-hmm. Now we're getting some ideas generated, we're working on it. Um, I also think about how important it is just to have a sense of purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. to our daily life. You know, yeah. I know Jay Stringer had in his book, Unwanted, that you know, men who lack purpose are seven times more likely to struggle with pornography mm-hmm. because the world will give us all kinds of artificial ways to feel good or feel a sense of like belonging and desire if we don't have something within us. And, and I'm, I'm a big advocate that, that would say, I don't think we have to have this one defined overarching purpose. Like my life exists to teach third graders, God, you know, mm-hmm. if, if you get super specific, awesome. But I think I hear yeah. from a lot of people that maybe have this anxiety about, I don't know my one specific purpose. And it's like, yeah. well, maybe it's a little more broad, but just having yeah. a sense of based on how I'm wired, who I am, what I think God really is calling me to in my yeah. life. And I'm, I'm working towards something. I'm moving towards something mm-hmm. that has a sense of purpose in it. That just starts to change, I think, so much else that appeals to us to kind of create that artificial purpose and and cause those mental health issues. So yeah. I, I think that, again, could be where a coach or a spiritual director or, you know, maybe there's a pathway at your church or a seminar you could attend that mm-hmm. helps you kind of unpack how do I define purpose for myself and, and yeah. even kind of having an overarching you know, rule of life or a, mm-hmm. a, a statement that says, this is what I'm about. 
yeah. and how do I structure my life around that? Yeah. Uh, it can be very, very significant. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so look at let's look at it from a faith standpoint. How do we approach mental health through our faith in a helpful way, like avoiding spiritual bypass or leaving faith out of it completely? It's a good question because um, I, I think traditionally what we've seen in the church, just like, or not just the church, but with Christians in general, is we saw this with pornography or sexual addiction, you know, just just stop it or it's just sin or it's just because your original sin. Um, on one hand, and I'm seeing this a lot with young people, Gen Alpha, Gen Z, they're growing up in such fundamental a, a fundamental brand of Christianity <clears throat> that they think, they literally think, I get comments all the time, that anxiety, depression, all those things are only caused by demons. Hmm. And they, they're like, see, it's in the New Testament. That's the only cause of it. Wow. Um, and so on one hand, I'm seeing that. On the other hand, hmm. traditionally what we've seen is if you're anxious, that means you're filled with fear and you're lacking faith. But fear and faith, a lot of people think that they're um, polar opposites or not, or that they're mutually exclusive, yeah. but they're not. I look at throughout the Bible, there's so many people who were filled with fear but took a step of faith yeah. at the same time. Yeah, courageous. And we've done that in our life. It's like, yeah, being courageous. It's God is calling me to do this. I'm a little bit nervous. I'm a little bit scared, yeah. but I'm full of faith that he's going to show up and that he's calling me to do this. You can be afraid and faithful at, at the same time. They're not mutually exclusive. Uh, on top of that, I think understanding what happens in your brain with anxiety and depression, if you understand just even a little bit about neuroscience, a little bit about addiction. Yeah. It's funny, in, in some of the research I've done, just getting into my own story and my own brain <laughs> is seeing the similarities. And even some um, psychologists will say this, the similarities between anxiety and depression and addiction, they function kind of similarly because they're releasing uh, neurochemicals into your brain or filling your body with neurochemicals. Um, they're a way of protecting yourself. Um, and anxiety in my own life became so addictive. And it wasn't like a conscious thing. It was just like- Was it like your baseline? Uh, it was my baseline, but it was also something would happen, and within a split second, I would just feel anxiety rushing through my body, mm. and um, I felt like I had no control over this. You know, for years, I was like, how am I going to overcome this anxiety? Because it's like an automatic reaction. Yeah. Yeah. And then my therapist taught me that anxiety is always caused by a subconscious or conscious automatic negative thought and a visual that comes with it. And so I had to really identify what is that thought. And as I identified the thought, I saw, started seeing patterns like, okay, I'm afraid of rejection. I'm af afraid of not being safe. That's triggering anxiety, split yeah. second. Neurochemicals, it's autom It's the neurological pathways like an addiction. And I had to start, start interrupting those. And that's how I've overcome anxiety in so many areas of my life. Um, so those are the two, I think, polar opposites we can spe on the spectrum we can, we can get to. Mm -hmm. But I think just diving in again to Proverbs 4.23, like, and seeing throughout Scripture how many people have dealt with anxiety, depression, yeah. suicidal thoughts, realizing that this is um, a yeah. part of fallen humanity. These things happen to everybody. And um, you can be fully faithful following Jesus and struggling with these things, and yet God invites us into, into more, to more freedom and it starts by understanding the why. What's really going on here? How did this begin? How has it rewired my brain and this become a pattern that I'm struggling with? And then learning to think about in my own life. Um, it is, uh, you know, take thoughts captive. I think about, think about things that are true, noble, right, and pure. I encourage people to think about what you're thinking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So many times we're not even interrupting right. the cycles. We're just... Let it ride. We're just... It's like flushing the toilet and going down in the shame cycle, the faster scale, the anxiety, depression, letting it ride. And we're told to think about things that are true, noble, right, and pure. Right. And I learned that with anxiety in my life, I wasn't doing that. Um, real practical example. Maybe no one can relate to this. Maybe some people can. 
but I, I developed this intense fear on overpasses. I was going through a stressful time and I just started having these intrusive thoughts about falling through overpasses. And just thinking that like this thing's going to collapse. Like who built this thing? Yeah. And in like, Texas, is, there's so many of there's them. There's so many. And the <laughs> biggest one in the country is right by my house. It's five levels up. Wow. And it's, it's about 95 feet. And so I wasn't, I didn't know how to do this at the time. I wasn't thinking, I wasn't guarding my thoughts. I wasn't taking thoughts captive. I was literally driving over that thing, all these intrusive thoughts wow, I'm going to fall through this thing. What if I fall through? Wow, that's real high up. Like just all these thoughts <laughs> yeah. as opposed to being vigilant in what scripture says. No, what's the truer story? Mm -hmm. And the truer story is knowing the stats, like these things hardly ever break or break or fall through. And there's no earthquakes in Texas. And yeah, I'm really safe up here. And plus God's in control and he's protecting me and he's sovereign and all those things. Um, and so I started doing that when I would go over those overpasses and that's how I overcame it is I would think about the truer story and be vigilant with my thoughts mm -hmm. and I would visualize being safe up there and Psalm 9, 9, the Lord is a refuge to the press, a stronghold in times of trouble, just visualizing this bubble of safety around yeah. me. Yeah. And then the anxiety started to go away. And so, so much of it is our thoughts and these biblical ideas that we're not just knowing, but knowing how to apply yeah. and live out um, to overcome these things. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I, I love that idea of thinking about what we're thinking about. And sometimes we do fall prey to that mindset of, I, I can't help it. That's just what I'm always going to think. It's this automatic thing, yeah. but not realizing even in a split second how much is taking place. Um, you know, for me, it's often how quickly my brain can determine, well, if this happens, then that might mm. happen. And if that happens, this could happen. And ultimately, then I'll be a failure. Mm. Yeah, and there'd be this pathway that ends with me in failure. Mm -hmm. But my brain in a nanosecond yep. could go through the four stages. And so now I'm reacting to failure, not yes. actually what's going on in the moment. And yeah. so learning just to evaluate what am I thinking, what's driving it. And when I start to feel that, what's my redirect? Like, what do I start mm -hmm. to think about instead? What Christ says is true what I know to be true. Um, yeah. It made me think too about many of us have seen a, a great message that John Lynch did on uh, the two pathways. And, and in that message, mm. he talks about our vision of Christ, that like there's this great pile of our sins and he's over on the other side of it. And we're trying to work our way through it. Be like, Jesus, I, I'm going to get there. You know, I'm working really hard. I'm going to get over there to you. And how often we might think that way in our faith when the truth is, that Jesus is actually on the side of our pile of sins with us, standing right there, his arm around us, like, yeah, I know about all this. None of it's a surprise. Like, let's go to work on it. Yeah. And I think about that when it comes to mental health. If we think that somehow this is a departure from Scripture or we're just hanging out in the self-help section at Barnes & Noble because there's no Christian books on this and, and God you know, is kind of waiting for us to fix this so we can mm -hmm. be with him, that's not going to help us. What if instead... In any area of a mental health journey, whether it's fear, anxiety, depression, shame, you know, all the things we've talked about today, if we really have a sense that Christ is right there with us, saying to us, in this world you will have trouble, mm. but take heart, I've overcome the world, and let's go after this together. And yeah. every step of that journey, we're doing it with him and through him and in yeah. his strength. Like it, it just makes a real difference, I think, in the energy we can bring to it, because we know I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing this in my own strength, that I have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to, to walk this journey of, of discipleship and maturing and growth in Christ, and he's with me every step of the way. So I, I think that that simple mindset is a huge difference mm -hmm. maker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, really quick, too, as you guys were sharing, I was thinking about Jesus, um, and Ben, you talked about um, really kind of broadening the definition of mental health mm -hmm. and that Jesus experienced, you know, mental health struggles, too, with the stress. Um, but you look at his life, and if that's true, the definition, then you can look at his life that he pulled away in mm -hmm. times to pray and be in silence and solitude. He constantly had people around him, close, close relationships, um, that inner circle of relationship. And so I think you can even just, and that's a way to definitely keep your faith involved is to look at the life of Jesus yeah. and just follow after what he's doing. Yeah. I remember a, a mentor of mine, he had a little booklet where the, the four gospels were rewritten to just be like one mm, seamless story. Oh, okay. No, the, none, none of the words changed, <laughs> but they just rewrote made it, the gospels. Yeah. They just oh. made it one <laughs> seamless book and it was called the life of Jesus. And he went through it and said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to underline every time if I was Jesus, I would have been anxious. Mm. And and then I'm going to really think about how does Jesus respond. And he's like, mm. 
he had underlined like hundreds of times. We're sure. like, man, that question would have made me anxious. Those yeah. people leaving would have made yeah. me anxious. The people <laughs> yeah. bringing this woman in front of me would have made me anxious. And and just learning that pattern of a non-anxious response yeah. because yeah. Jesus knew who he was, knew where he'd come from, knew where he yes. was going, and had that settledness in the Father. Um, yeah, just really cool exercise to think about. Yeah. Uh, so Ben, like in so many areas of life, you know, we, we tend not to be stagnant. We're either growing and moving in a healthy direction or we're declining and maybe sliding away towards unhealth. And so as we look to wrap up this episode, what would you say are some ideas or strategies that people could continue to employ to make sure that for the long haul, we're moving in a healthy direction with our mental health? To play the long game. Um, think about this as a lifestyle change for life. I mean, yeah. so many of y'all who have been through recovery, yeah. you know, as you started out, it was like, how am I going to not look at porn for a whole month? <laughs> or alone um, the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's how it was <laughs> for me. Like, it seemed impossible. I could not imagine and I didn't want to imagine my life without porn. Um, I couldn't see the 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 truer story and what God wanted to do and what was on the other side. And now I wouldn't trade it to go back to that mm. lifestyle because now I'm living such a robust life of fun and freedom and let's keep going with the Fs, uh, faith and uh, <laughs> Come fellowship on, Pastor ben. and, and, Bring it on. and <laughs> food and, Come on. and <laughs> yeah. nail it. Um, but it's, it's just so much better on this side. And I think the same thing is true with pain and struggles in our life. Um, painful yet familiar is often easier than the struggle of, of change and mm-hmm. the cost of change. Yeah. And so we can get content in these struggles, but Jesus calls us to shalom and wholeness. And um, Adam Young, he's a therapist. He says that God is passionate about your mental health. He says something like this. Forgive me, Adam, if you see this. God is, God is so passionate about your mental health because he's about shalom and the restoration of all things, mm-hmm. restoring the damage that sin has done, and it has wreaked havoc on people's mental health. And Satan is called the father of lies by Jesus, and so it's no wonder that Satan comes after our minds yep. and gets us to believe lies and, yep. and whatnot. And so I'd encourage you to see this. Rather, take the pressure off. I mean, that's what you want with mental health. Don't add more pressure on. <laughs> See this as a journey. Yeah. See this as a lifestyle. Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light. Take it one day at a time, mm-hmm. one week at a time, one year at a time, yeah. one decade decade at a time. I just hit 10 years of freedom from porn and masturbation. Never thought I would see that. If you told me that 10 years ago, I'd be like, nope, I'm out. Yeah. I'm not doing this pure desire thing. Yeah, <laughs> I'm right. running too much. Yeah. You know, I... I wouldn't want to know all the stuff I would have to go through, all the work I would have to do. Mm-hmm. And I didn't need to know that 10 years ago. Yeah. I just needed to take it one day at a time, yeah. one principle at a time, and walk with Jesus through it and um, carry that burden with him and others. So that's what I would encourage you to do. Yeah. If you're really struggling with your mental health, if you're kind of struggling, if you just want to grow a little, yeah, start implementing a discipline that we talked about today. Mm-hmm. or start seeing a therapist or start yeah. reading a book on mental health. Yeah. You can p- pick up my book, Free to Thrive. Boom, <laughs> yeah. plug, boom. There you go. Yeah, I think it is just it is just really important to think about, like, sanctification is a process, and that is, like, in this world that's full of sin, it's God's design for us that we will grow over time, mm-hmm. not that we'll mature overnight or become this perfect thing overnight. And so just know that anything that you do is going to be a process um, mm-hmm. and that the rhythms and the habits that you have, they shape who you're becoming and will be eventually. And so just to always focus on, and and I love what you're saying. It's not this big thing, like, and I love this. We've talked about commitment to change in group. It's like, I'm going to wake up at 5 a.m. every day of the week and I'm going to read my Bible for five hours. It's like, well, what time do you start work? Seven. It's like, all right, dude, that's not going to happen. Right. You know, like, and you've never been up at 5 a.m. in your life, but just that starting small. And a guy that we follow, John Mark Comer, says this a lot just start where you're at. Don't start where you think you should be, just start where you're at. Yep. And that's going to be super helpful. Yeah, I always like the running analogies. And I think a lot in this area, it's to run the mile that you're on. Hmm that all you can do is run the mile that you're on. And if if I spend too much time thinking about the miles that I've already run, um, I can lose sight. I can maybe overtrain because I'm like, well, I ran fast yesterday. I'm going to run fast today. 
or vice versa. If I'm thinking too much about the miles ahead of me, I can get discouraged. Like that's so far, I can never get there. And and in essence, you're trying to run them all at once. And I think sometimes mm -hmm. when we're facing issues like we've talked about today of depression, anxiety, fear, shame, failure, like just all the stuff, that idea, like you said about pornography, Ben, of like being totally free of it. Like, is that even possible? Like mm -hmm. how, I, I, I can't see any way of getting to the finish line of this part of my journey. It's like, great, you don't have to. Run the mile you're on. Mm. Like what right now is having the deepest impact on your mental health? And would you be willing to face that with the help of God, with the help of others in your life to yeah. take that next step, as, as you were saying, Trevor, and, and be in that mile as long as it takes to run it well. And what will happen is that season will change. You'll find that maybe the issue that you started addressing changes a little bit, and, and now you need to take another step or go in a different direction, yeah. or you find that the anxiety was actually more about caffeine, or you found the anxiety mm -hmm. was actually more about your family of origin and yeah. some unaddressed stuff, and now you're like, oh, yep. I've, to address anxiety, I've got to go into that too. Like, mm -hmm. okay, now I'm, I'm on a new mile, and I'm going to run this one, yeah. and I'm going to take those steps, and just committing to keep running that next mile, you do mm -hmm. look back at times then and, and see, wow, I've it's been 10 years and I never would have believed I could go to this 10 year mark. And it's now just my way of living. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what happens when we just keep right. taking those next steps. And so whatever it is for you, our listener, like that's why we do this podcast is to encourage you take that next step and trust that God will meet you there. Yep. And then when you need to go beyond that, he'll meet you in that one too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep. And may we stop trying to run other people's races. Mm. Yeah. Like, word. I'm never trying to run the race, whatever shamrock shake race you <laughs> ran the other day, like 24 <laughs> miles, 8 a.m. No, thanks. I'm yeah. going to run my my race, which is walking yep. 30 minutes a yes, day, yeah. 60 yeah. days, exactly. yes, six days a week. That's yeah. right. Uh, this was a great episode. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot, really helpful for a lot of people. Maybe someone who is, you know, experiencing light anxiety and isn't really sure what's going on, or someone who maybe is in a deep depression. There's a lot of hope and a lot of possibility, and we just love having you with us. Obviously, in person more than we do online, but appreciate you being here, you sharing your story and everything. So, thanks, man. Absolutely, thanks, y'all.